that the enemy's been defeated. You know the enemy's been defeated. Oh, yes, the enemy's been defeated. I just wonder, is there anybody out here today that can testify that the devil's already been defeated in your life? Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Up a voice of praise and let the devil in all hell know that Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he has set you free from drugs. That he has set you free from a perverted lifestyle. That he has given you a course of life, a victory and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you, amen, the devil has been defeated. Amen. I'm alive today. I said I'm alive today. Praise the Lord. And it's good to be alive. Amen. It's good to have the life of God flowing in through my life. Amen. I'm thankful today to be here. To be able to come to church and to worship Him. Amen. I, I begin to just give God praise because, you know, I said, you know, I could be a lot of things today could be going on in my life. A lot of bad stuff could be happening to me. I could either be on my deathbed, I could be dead. I could be in jail today. See, there's a lot of folks that should be in jail today, but they're not praising God today. There's a lot of folks that should be dead today, but yet they're still not praising God today. For whatever reason, they put something other than in the place of God. They're not worshiping like they should. I want to tell you something. I don't want to let one day go by that I don't realize how thankful that I am that God has spared me. Huh? <laughs> yeah, y'all don't get that yet. I said, I don't want to let not one day go by. Not one. Not just Sunday. But not one day. Not even on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday. I want to wake up every day of my life thankful for what the Lord has done for me. You know, Psalmist David put it like this. He said, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. His mercy endureth forever. Oh, hallelujah. You see, I want to tell you this morning, you ought to be grateful this morning that God has done such a good work in your life. Huh? Let the redeemed of the Lord, let them say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. He didn't just save me out the choir loft. I'm going to preach just a minute right here. Y'all need to hear this. I said, God didn't save me out from underneath the pew. God didn't save me out from underneath an altar. He saved me out of the ghettos of sin. God saved me out of crack abuse. He saved me out of heroin addiction. He saved me out of cocaine addiction. He saved me out of a drunken state of mind where I had to smoke weed every night just to calm down enough to go to sleep. Huh? Amen. God saved me from a life of sin and destruction. Oh, I want to tell you right now, friend. He saved me from the hand of the enemy. So let the redeemed say so. Now, I'm a firm believer in this. Them that's been forgiven much, they love much. Amen. You say, well, pastor, you know, I've been in church all my life. I didn't have a drug addiction. If you were born again today, I don't care if you went to church your whole life, you were still rescued from the hand of Satan. You were still delivered from the very clutches of Satan himself. And God snatched you out of his hand by the power of the blood he shed on Calvary to give you new life. Hallelujah to God. You see, I'm a little bit offset today, a little off kilter because this is my pointing hand. And I'm having to point left-handed. But I've had to learn how to do a few things with the left hand that I hadn't been doing so much with the right hand. And I always do with the right hand, rather. But I'm learning how to do things, you see. And sometimes God's just got to mess some things up for you. Amen. That you... <laughs> Hallelujah. How many is glad to be here this morning? How many says, Pastor, I'm grateful to be in the house of God? Amen. I want Brother Mark to testify for us this morning. Amen, because he told us this morning just how grateful that he was to be able to be here. Praise the Lord. Amen, Testify. amen. Praise the Lord. How's everybody doing? Good. Yeah. Has God done anything for you lately? Yes, sir. They used to have a song that said, uh, what have you done for me lately? Well, I tell you, God's doing something every day. And like I can say at New Life, it's just, it's just like miracles taking place here. Would yes. you agree? Yes. 
Amen. And uh, I don't know, I just feel like the prayer here is worthwhile. And, and uh, I, I think if you've got something going on in your life, it's worth coming and, and praying about it here at the church. Yeah, Amen. pray at home and call your loved ones and pray, but, but come here and pray because I believe this is truly a family of God. And I just want to say, uh, you know, my mother was diagnosed with cancer and uh, probably about three weeks ago. And then um, her mother died recently. So it's just been a lot. Those are just two things. I'm sure she has a whole lot more than that on her plate. But just those two things I feel like was enough to weigh her down. And my oldest brother normally takes her when she has procedures done at the hospital. And he was on the road truck driving. So he called me and asked me if I would do it. And I said, sure. And I went and uh, picked her up, took her to the hospital. So I'm sitting there waiting on him to install that wire so she can go take her over to the hospital and have the procedure done. And um, I was just sitting there, and, and she came out, and she said, uh, she said, hey, guess what? I said, what? She said, they couldn't find anything. Hallelujah. Yeah. I said, what? She says, uh, no, they couldn't find it. She said they did an x-ray and, and everything. They couldn't find it, so they decided to do an ultrasound. They still couldn't find it. Thank you, so... I said, hey, you know, I, I really didn't want to tell you this. I said, but we've been praying for you at our church. And I said, there have been three cases I know of where women have, have had cancer, hallelujah, Yeah. at the church, and God has healed them. They couldn't find anything. So I just want to say God is still in the healing business today. Yes, I, I know amen. we might not believe that, or do we believe it? Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm excited about it. It's strengthened my faith just to see these cases of of cancer being healed, you know, just right before my eyes. I mean, it, it makes me want to pray. I'm trying to think of areas of my life I need to pray about. And, and so I can come here and strengthen and even more and just believe God for everything, every oh, little yes. bitty thing, you know, yes, uh, how to tie my shoes, you know, or whatever. I mean, yeah. I just think uh, nothing's too small or too great for God, you know. But I just wanted to share that, that maybe somebody's faith might be strengthened today. Hallelujah. Who, who knows what we're going through? That's right. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Mark. Amen. Appreciate that wonderful, good testimony. Go ahead, sister. You want to testify? Yes? Woo! Hallelujah. Amen. For you that couldn't hear that, she said, I come to you today blinking in my smile. The other day when we prayed for her, she couldn't blink. Before we left here, her eyes started moving around, and she started blinking a little bit. Amen? So how many knows that God's good? Amen? Brother Mark? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to have you with us today, my friend. Amen. Make yourself welcome right at home. Amen. How many knows that when you go into the house of God, and you're around the other children of God, you're in family. Amen. So we're just glad to have you home today, my friend. Amen. You're part of our family. God bless you. Good to have you in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. God's good, isn't he? Amen. Yes. 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 Amen. Yes. Don't it feel good to have a church family? No, you don't. No, you don't. Yep. That's right, Brother Rick. Aren't you glad you don't have to do anything out of the ordinary to just be welcome and accepted in the house and the body of Christ? Amen. We're all family because Jesus died for us. That's right. Amen. Not anything we did ourselves, but he gave his life for us. Amen. And by that, amen, gave us a transfusion of blood that made us all brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. I feel a good spirit in here this morning. Amen. I want to preach. Uh -huh. Go ahead, bro. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Right. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's right. Praise God. Amen. Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise. <laughs> praise God. Oh, I love testimonies. Amen. Praise God. It's so good to be in the Lord's house and to hear the people testify. I miss Tuesday night, man. That's my one of my favorite services to be in is our Thanksgiving service. And me and my friend back there, we both, we had our wing hot chopped off, didn't we, sister? Amen. She was down from me a little bit, getting her wing clipped. And I was down over here getting my wing clipped, the same place. Same doctor clipped us too, didn't he? Said, it sure is hard to fly with one wing, I can tell you that. Thank God, if I have to fly around in a circle, huh? I'm going to still fly. Praise the Lord. Until I learn how to get this other wing to do something where I can get it straightened back out again, I'm going to just keep flapping in a circle. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's just good to be here this morning. Feel the presence of the Lord here. Well, we're going to get right into our message this morning, and we're going to talk to you on the final message today on the 30 Days to Live series we've been working on. 30 Days to Live. And today I want to I want to talk about how we need to fight for peace. And in, in this series, we've discussed a few things and we've went over a few things, we've seen a few testimonies from different ones in our video clips that we were able to bring to you. And we was able to see some uh, lives that had been changed by not so good news and things that had happened to them in the course of their life. And uh, just as Brother Mark was saying just a moment ago, you know, it's very important that we keep our mind in check, that we don't allow ourselves to get so, so heady and high-minded that we think, you know, that, that we're promised tomorrow because we're not. We're not promised tomorrow. I, I know a lot of folks think that, you know, that God's just so in love with uh, them that, you know, that, that He's just not going to let anything happen to their life. But, friend, it's, it's, it's just rains on the just and the unjust. You're going to have problems in your life. You're going to... You're going to face despair. You're going to face sickness. You're going to face trial. You're going to have battles, and you're even going to face death if the Lord tarry is coming. One day, you're going to die in this natural state, but you're going to take on a new life in the spiritual realm. Amen? And we must keep ourselves in check with this to realize that life is precious. It's, it's just for a moment that we're here, and we must take full advantage of of every opportunity that God has given to us, that we can do what God wants us to do. Amen. That people can be touched and changed that are around us. Because I've only got a short time, amen, to, to, inf uh, to have an influence and affect people's lives the way that God really wants me to. So I must utilize that space of time and use it wisely. Amen. And use it to a place to where I can be positively impacting people on a daily basis. That when they come in contact with me, that they'll see the life change that God has placed in me and desire this Christ. The whole mission and purpose of being here on this planet is that other people can see what God's done in me and want it. And want it. And I only have a small space window of time to make all this happen. So I must work while I have day. Nighttime comes when no man can work. We won't have the opportunity to reach, to reach the one that God has planted me here to reach. I know that there's a group, there's a group of people that's in the circle of my life that God wants me to empower and to impact. And I know it's my duty to make sure that I take full advantage of the time I have with those people in that circle to make sure I infect them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't say affect, I said infect with the gospel of Jesus Christ that I just get them radically possessed in love with God the way that I am amen so I have your Bible I want you to turn with me Psalms chapter 39 verse number 4 and 
5. I'm going to read that again. It's been our opening text throughout the whole series here. Psalms chapter 39, verse number 4 through 5. <laughs> Scripture reads like this in verse 4. It says, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age as, as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. Father, we love you and we thank you this morning for all your goodness and grace and mercy. We're so thankful this morning, God, that we're not ignorant. We have been enlightened by the powerful word of God. And Lord, you have given a commandment to us and said that you would us not be ignorant, but you would want us to learn your word and to hide it into our hearts. So today I pray, God, that your word would be like a seed that it would be planted deep into the heart and soul of every human being that has ears to hear today. Anoint our ears to hear it. Anoint our hearts to receive it. Plow up that fallow ground. That, Lord, that the seed of God can be planted in rich, fertile soil. I pray that, God, if there be one lost today, they'd be saved. Lord, if there be one today, Lord, that is doubting, that you would just cast down all their doubt and their vain imagination of fear. And that, God, you would fill their hearts full of the love of God. I pray today that, Lord, there be someone here today or that may be watching by TV that's lame in their body, sick in some kind of way, that, God, that you would just touch and heal, save and deliver by the power of your strong hand. We know that, God, that you are not limited to anything. We are praying today to an all-powerful God, asking that, God, that you would release an anointing upon the face of this land, that you would draw a harvest in, before the day comes that we either go by the way of the grave or by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, we ask today, God, that you would draw us in today before it's too late. And Father, we'll give you all the praise. For it's in Jesus' name, God, we pray. And the church says, Amen. And amen. Shake somebody by the hand and tell them, say, I'm fighting for peace. I'm fighting for peace. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. All right, we want to talk to you again today on the series that we've been in, and we're going to close this series today on the 30 days to live. 30 days to live. You know, how, how would you react if you were told that you had 30 days left to live, that you only had 30 more days to the, to the span of your life, and at the end of that 30 days, there's no longer going to be a Lavoie heart anymore. It's not going to be one walking on this planet, walking around, breathing this air, witnessing these pretty decorations, being able to be with our families, being able to do the activities that we do. We understand and know today that when we die, all this is over here. Amen. And we enter into something that we are totally unfamiliar with. Can you say amen? Amen. We can read about it. We can understand it. We can have faith and we can hope in it. But we do not know exactly is what's going to be like and the experience of it. So therefore, it sometimes will cause us to have anxiety or fear of what is coming in the unknown. I want to try to help you through this series that we've been going through. I wanted to try to help you to understand that a lot of people, they spend most of their life worrying in fear about what's going to happen in the unknown. I want to tell you, God does not want you to worry about that. I have hope to know this one thing right here, that to be absent from this body is to be present with my Lord. That is a hope in me that drives me beyond fear and failure and doubt and unbelief because I know without a shadow of a doubt with everything on the inside of me that I stand for as a Christian and I know that with what, no matter what the doctor says, no matter what anybody else says, I know that I'm going to be all right because God is going to be with me. He said, I will be with you even to the end of the earth. Hallelujah. Now, just because my life may end does not mean that the earth is going to end. So I know that God has made a promise to me beyond the existence of even my natural life here on this planet. 
So I have an understanding within me to know that no matter what I face, God is still going to be with me. So in that, I have comfort and I have peace and I have joy even to know that even if I was to give a sentence unto me to say that I have 30 days left to live, that I know that God is going to help me. I want to talk this morning about the fight for peace that we need to have in our lives. How would your life be different if you had 30 days to live? If you only had 30 days left to live, what would you change about your life? I've had many different uh, responses about this. People have called me throughout the week and some has emailed me and some has told me different things that they would change and what they would like to do. And I, I, my major one was, and the reason why I wanted to uh, wait until the last series of the message would be the fight for peace is because I want you to understand something. Death, when you face death, there's one thing that's most important to most every person I've ever been with on their deathbed. And that is one thing, peace. They want to leave this world in peace. They don't want to leave this world in turmoil. They don't want to leave this world, amen, thinking that somebody in this world has a, that they have a grudge against them or, or that they have one against them. They all want to make sure that everything is going to be all right. You know, I, I began to think about this and I said, you know, the Bible is plain and is clear and the Lord teaches us. He says, you know, I want you to worship me. The Bible teaches us that God wants, him, wants us all to worship Him. Don't you believe that? God wants us all to praise Him. He said, let everything has breath. Praise the Lord. But you know, there's a verse of Scripture in the Bible that tells us that God says that He wants us to just leave our gift even at the altar. In other words, God don't want you to even praise Him. He says, that's good and that's all uh, wonderful, but I want you to stop that and I want you to go to that brother or that sister that you have all with and I want you to make that right then I want you to come back and spend some time with me it's going to get quiet this morning because this morning I'm going to get down to where you really live at I want to talk to you on the grounds of the property that you reside on I want to talk to you this morning about amen God speaking peace into your life you see we've, we've watched videos and we're going to see another clip here and after a while but in this video clips that we've watched, we've seen people that have been diagnosed with terminal illness. And the main thing that they had in their life was that they declared to be the most important was relationships. Didn't have anything to do. None of them said, you know what, I'm really going to miss my bass boat. Not one of them said that. Not one of them said, you know what, I'm going to miss that bank account that I've saved up for so long. I'm going to miss it so bad when I die. No, you know what they were saying? I miss, I'm going to miss the opportunity to see my children grow up. I wish I could grow old with my, my husband. You know, I'm really going to miss the, the, the relationship that I have in my church and, and the campus that I worship on. I'm going to miss worshiping in that house. You know, I talked to a man that was dying one time and I said, Brother, if you could ask God to give you anything, what would it be? He said, I'd like to have one more Holy Ghost filled service on this earth. He said, I'd like to worship God with His people one more time in the spirit of holiness. To where we all was in one mind and one accord and praising Him and everybody was dancing and shouting and praising and speaking in tongues. As a, he said, that would be my request. I said, you mean you wouldn't ask God to save your life? He said, no, I'm ready to see Jesus, but it's one thing that I'm going to miss of anything else. I believe I'll miss being in church. I looked at him and I said, well, let me tell you something, brother. You go into the biggest church service you've ever had in your life. You don't have a clue of what you're fixing to experience right now. You're fixing to enter in to a place that is filled with nothing but praise and worship. Amen. Where everybody there, amen, is redeemed of God. And there won't be one person in that place, brother, who is not in the same mindset as you are. <laughs> Hey man, I want to tell you something this morning that God is wanting you and me here today to understand there's some things worth fighting for and peace is one of them. What do you mean by that, Brother Hart? Well, let me share a scripture with you this morning. This comes to us also from the New Living Translation. Amen. And it says, Love your neighbor as yourself in Mark 12 and 31, Jesus speaking. 
Amen. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Ephesians 4 and verse number 3. Amen. Now, listen to, listen to what I'm trying to tell you this morning. Jesus was asked a question. And they said, Lord, tell us the greatest commandment. And he said, well, you know, it's love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your mind, your strength. Amen. In other words, you've got to love God with all your being. He said, but there's another one that I'm going to tell you that hinges off of that one. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. So God was putting here in the flesh, the man Jesus, amen, was putting a strong emphasis on what? Relationship. To love your neighbor, amen, or your brother or your sister, amen, you've got to have a form of some kind of relationship. Oh, my. A lot of times we, we get so caught up, you know, in, in, in the hustle and bustle of work and ripping and running and roaring and going and going and going and going that we absolutely neglect relationships. And then when somebody does something to us or says something to us, you know, that's just not altogether pleasing to us, we first thing we want to do is mark them off, etch them out, and get rid of them. And then we think when we go into the house of God and we, oh, glory, 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 that God's going to receive that. God's not receiving it. Because what God is interested in you is making relationship right. In other words, He wants you to fight for the peace. You know what the hardest things I've ever done in my life is? It's not to preach. It's not to sing. Oh, no, them are the easy things for me to do. It, it's not even pastoring so much is not the hardest thing I've ever done. Let me tell you the most hardest thing. I, that's not real good English, is it? But it's right. Anyway, the most hardest thing I've ever done is, is, is fight for peace. Oh, yeah. It's easy, amen, to turn away from somebody, but it's hard to rebuild a broken relationship. Huh? Amen, you know why? Because you've got to fight for that. You have to fight for peace. Amen. It's the hardest, some of the hardest things I've ever done is to do what Christ told me to do, is to go to them and make things right. If they, you know, you can't make people love you, though. Let's get that clear. You can't make folks accept you, love you, or even want to be around you. But you have to follow through with the Scripture. You have to be obedient to what God has commanded you to do. I've had to go to people, I can't tell you how many times. Folks, I didn't really do anything wrong to them. I didn't do nothing. I knew I was innocent. I hadn't done nothing. But some reason or another, they got an odd against me. They're running me down. They're talking bad about me to everybody in town. You know, I want to go to them real quick. I'm not having a struggle going to them. It's how I go to them <laughs> that I'm struggling. <laughs> Let's get that clear, amen? I mean, I'm not struggling with going up to them and looking them in the eye. No, no. I'm not even struggling with hugging them real hard. Very hard. You know, I'm struggling with how I go to them. And the Scripture tells us we need to go to them and make things right to them. If they don't receive my peace, then I shake the dust off my feet and I depart from there. You see, you've got to understand with God, there's always a process. With God, there's always a principle. And when you, do get, when you get outside of the boundaries of the principle and the process that God is doing, you put everything that God is trying to do in your life and makes it null and void. So in other words, you say, well, you know what? Bless God, I ain't do nothing to them. They ain't got no right to be talking about me and running me down. I tell you right now, it ain't nothing but a bunch of big liars. They're hypocrites. They're this, they're that, they're the others. I can tell you right now, you can say all that and rightfully be able to say that even. But because of the Scripture... But because of the Word of God and the principle thereof... You will get outside of the will of God and the blessings that God is trying to give you will not be able to flow into your life because you're not fighting for peace. It's easy to write them off. It's easy, amen, to turn against people. It's easy when somebody, uh, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends, you remember growing up as a kid, Boy, I'm telling you, I went through so many girls. As go it wasn't even, man, they'd just look at me cross-eyed. I'd break up with them. So I ain't putting up with that. Have you seen the little pretty blonde in the homeroom class? And you think I'm going to let you say lip off at me like you? I bumped your head. 
I'd write them off like that. Let me tell you the reason why I was doing that is because I wasn't being taught how to maintenance relationships. You know why there's so much divorce in our world today? It's because we're not being taught how to fight for peace. I want you young people to hear me this morning because there is a principle with God that you must fight for peace in your life. Amen. Amen. The hardest thing that you're going to ever do in your life is to maintain and maintenance peace. Have you ever seen folks that they, they seemingly they never are happy? Their whole life revolves around misery and gloom and despair. They're, and they're never ever seemingly like they just really got it going on, man. They're always battling, usually with the same old junk. Huh? You know how, you remember, y'all remember Batman? He said, we'll be back here next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Huh? You ever notice there's people like that in their life? They're going to be struggling with the same old thing. Over and over and over. This time next year, they're going to be struggling with the same old thing. Let me tell you why. They never fight for peace in that situation. Your marriage, if it's in trouble, you owe that marriage the opportunity to fight for peace in that marriage. If you don't fight for peace in it, guess what? The devil is going to run havoc in it and destroy it. You say, well, my kids are out of control. You owe your children, amen, the right for you to fight for peace and harmony in the relationship with your kids. You say, well, Brother Hart, you don't understand. Me and my family, we just cannot get alone. I want to tell you, that's a lie from the devil. You can get alone with them. You might have to fight for peace. You mean to tell me I got to go to them even when I know they're the ones that done me wrong? Yeah. Don't you hate that? Huh? Let's just get real. Don't you just really hate that? Why did God have to put that in the Bible? I wish he just put it in there, you know, that, you know, if they do you wrong, write them off, forget about them, go on about your business and be happy, saith the Lord. Wouldn't that be nice? But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He said we've got to fight for what we know is right. We've got to fight for the peace, amen, that God wants us to have. Listen to me. Peace ain't going to just stay there because it's there. Peace comes because you keep it there. Peace will only be there because you keep it there. If you quit fighting for peace in your marriage, in your home, on your job, and in your church, there won't be no peace. You give the enemy the right to step in when you quit fighting for peace. You see, the peace of God, amen, is what passes all of our understanding. Have you ever noticed that something can be going on in people that really fight for peace in their life? Amen, if something bad can be going on, and it seems like, you know, they really don't care. Yeah, she said, my mama. <laughs> you know, something can be, terrible turmoil can be happening in their life to where you say, my God, how are you keeping it together? It's the peace of God. It passes all of our normal, natural understanding to the place that we really can't figure it out. I can't get my finger on it. I can't. How come that person just really got so much happiness in their life when they're broke? <laughs> they don't have nothing, man. But they're the happiest person I've ever seen in my life. I'll tell you how. Because they don't rest their happiness and peace upon their material possessions. Their peace does not come from what they own on this planet. Amen. Their peace comes from an inner dwelling of the Most High God. Amen. That says, I am everything that you need. You see, back in the times of the Great Depression that the American people went through, most of the people that lived through that has gone on to be with the Lord right now. But you know what? I remember my grandpa, he went through all that Great Depression time. He used to talk about a big five-pound sack of flour he could buy with a nickel and things like that. Well, you know, and I said, you know, how could that be bad when you bought a bag of flour for a nickel, man, when it costs you four bucks now to buy that thing? I said, how can that be bad? He said, well, son, it was because the dollar was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. He said, those were some of the hardest times I ever went through in my life. He said, but they were some of the most powerfulest times I ever experienced in my life. I said, how could that be? He said, well, son, what you don't realize is, he said, is when a man don't have nothing and he has no means to get anything, he said, unless God supplies it, you don't have it. He said, so we learned how to pray for everything that we had. 
He said sometimes, he said, you depended on the crops to make. He said, and if it didn't rain, he said, it would scorch the crops. So we prayed as a church for God to send the rain. Oh, yeah. He said we would gather together in the community and pray that God would let it rain so our crops would flourish. He said a lot of times, I can't tell you the numbers of times that I have got on my face and prayed God supply the means that come up with the money. This winter's coming and my kids need shoes. They can't go barefooted, God, all winter long. You want me to tell you what he was doing? He was fighting for peace in poverty-stricken times. Amen. And he told me this. He said, you know what? He said, the craziest thing is, is he said, now, he, my grandpa's done gone on to be with the Lord. And he said, but this was years ago, me and him were talking. And he told me, he said, son, let me tell you something. The crazy thing about it was, he said, is back then we had nothing, but there was such an exuberant praise that come from God's people in that time. He said, we'd gather together in our services, and we would just lift God up and praise God. He said, and now it seems like we've got everything that we prayed for. He said, and now we feel like we don't have anything worth the praising for. And I said, why do you think that is, Papa? He said, because we quit fighting for this people. God gave us the peace, and we thought, oh, we will have it. We took it for granted. We said we'll have it for the rest of our lives. And the next thing you know, something now else has crept in, and here we are out holding the bag, wondering why God has let us down. God had let us down. We quit fighting for the peace. Why did God let my marriage fall apart? He didn't let my marriage fall apart. I did when I quit fighting for peace in it. Why is my home divided? Because I quit fighting for peace in my home. Why is my church, why is there so many churches splitting up today? Why is there church split after church split? Why is there so many churches in our community? It's because we've had so many church splits. These ain't church plants. You don't plant a church two blocks down the road. Come on, people, let's get real with each other. You've got a disgruntled bunch of folks here that get mad because they can't get along with the disgruntled bunch of folks over here. So this group says, we'll go down there and build a new church. Then it ain't long, this group in here is mad at the other part of the group, and they get mad, and they go down the road the other way and build another church. And then the church that went down there is mad. They split up, and they go, you want me to tell you the reason why that's going on? It's because they have never brought it under subjection to God and fought for peace and reconciliation. I, see, I always like to tell folks this. If you left another church because you was mad at somebody and come here, and you hadn't reconciled and made things right, guess what you're going to do? You're going to bring all that baggage right here. And you're going to experience the same old junk that you went through there. You're going to experience here with someone else. You may have went through it with someone wearing britches there, but you're going to go through it maybe here with someone wearing a skirt. Same spirit, same problem, different face. What do you mean, Brother Hart? I'll tell you the reason why that you're going through that is is because you haven't fought for the peace and reconciliation of that problem. And so that has not been crushed in your life. You will continue this vicious circle, amen, until you get it right. Children of Israel wandered in the wilderness 40 years because they were not able to get it right. Fighting for peace... It's worth it. Nothing else seems to matter, and nothing else really seems to be significant value, amen, on the day that we are to meet our Maker, amen, other than the peace of God resting in our lives. Amen. In Ephesians 4 and 3, I read to you a moment ago, says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This is Peter speaking to the Ephesian church, and I just wondered, I said, God, what does he mean by make every effort? Why would he bring that out? Now listen to this. I looked it up, and this word, amen, every effort means this simply this. It means, uh, it means, Azuntus, amen. And that word means to strive eagerly or strive earnestly. Amen. So in other words, God is saying to us to strive eagerly to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Strive eagerly to do it, God says. Don't let nothing get in your way, amen, to keep the bond of peace. What do you mean, 
by this, Pastor? Why are you telling us this? Because if you ever really want joy in your life, you first got to learn how to fight for peace. If you don't have peace, you have discord. The opposite of peace is discord. You know what discord is? It's when one is torn in two. When there's no agreement, when two people cannot agree together, the Bible says they what? They're in discord. They can't get along. They, they can't get it right. They, they're, they're, they're blind. They're, they're not able to work together and the house is divided. And the Bible says a house divided cannot stand. But peace will do one thing. It will bring unity. It will bring love. And it will bring the favor of God upon whatever that situation and relationship is. God will breathe into it. Because peace is the thing that will move the heart of God. Jesus made it clear and he told us, he said, when you enter a house, you speak that peace to that home. Let me tell you something. Peace, amen, is worth fighting for. Now, the first thing that you must do, amen, that God is calling you to fight for in this peace is, is to confront humbly. To confront humbly. In Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24, it says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift and at the altar, amen, there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go, be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift again. God said he wants you to just leave it right there. See, we have totally misinterpreted that. Misinterpreted. Is that anything like misinterpreting? We have totally, totally, totally misinterpreted that scripture. We have took it completely out of its context. Well, just leave my gift at the altar. I'll just leave it there. This, this is the southern way of doing it. I know that Ricky's got problems with me and me and him's got problems and, you know, and let's just say, now, he didn't do this. He's my friend. But I know he took money from me and he used me and he, he manipulated a situation that me and him was in business together with and he manipulated a situation and took advantage of me. And I tell you right now, he is a low-down, good-for-nothing, wretched dog. Now, I've lived the past two months like that. You know, don't hang around with Ricky. He'll rip you off. He's a dog. Sister, Ricky will rip you off. I saw you talking to him outside. Do you know what he did to me? Let me just tell you what he Let me tell you. Sister, what Ricky did to me, he's going to do the same thing to you and your husband. I know. I know him. Trust me. So I've run Ricky down to all the people here. You see that, Ricky, how that worked? You're welcome. <laughs> I've run him down. Now I'm here in church, and guess what? I went to the doctor the other day, and the doctors told me that they found a spot on my lungs, and it may be cancer. I want to biopsy it this week. Woo! Brother Hart. Oh, Brother Hart, I need you to anoint me and pray for me. Got a spot that may be cancer on me. I need a move of God. And all of a sudden, I'm praying, and I'm trying to get my breakthrough, and I just don't understand why it's so difficult and hard for me. And then the Spirit, and I'm going to tell you, this is how He works with all of us. Amen. The Spirit of God will come to you and say, you'll be praising and worshiping the Lord, and next thing you know is you'll be hearing yourself talking about Ricky Gibson. Wish I had somebody help me preach right now. Well, God, you know He's the one who wronged me. I didn't do that. That's not my fault, God. Well, I guess I just need to leave it there. See, we made a song out of Leave it there, leave it there. Bring your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. Remember that song? We made a song out of it. Let me tell you the reason why. It's because if I can just bring it and leave it there, that takes everything away from me. Puts it all back on God. And God's already done everything He's going to do for you. Understand, he don't owe you nothing. Oh, let me say that again. God does not owe you anything. 
He has paid the price. He has already done everything that he needs to do. Now he says this. He said, I've made the way for you. You just leave your burden there and get up and go make it right. So I'll just leave it there. Lord, you know I talk bad about Ricky. Woo! Oh, God. I'm sorry I did that. Lord, forgive me. Help me not do that no more. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, I feel good. And guess what, Brother Hot? For a little while, you will feel good. But guess what's going to happen? Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord, holy, holy, holy. I'll dance like David. Dance. I'm going to dance like David. I'm going to. I'm going, I ain't going to let him hinder me. I'm going to dance like David dance. That's, boy, I tell you, boy, I could really get in and worship the Lord if he didn't sit on the front row next to me. Now, I'm preaching good this morning, ain't I? Huh? Now, here's the question I want to ask you. If we really live like we only had 30 days left to live, hey, man, I would not let that hinder me. Huh? You may tell you how I'd fix it. I'd leave that gift right there, and I'd go over there, and I'd say, look here, buddy, me and you had a disagreement. And I'm going to humbly, I'm going to confront him humbly. I'm not going to walk up to him and say, hey, look here, boy. Me and you got a problem, and I'm going to straighten it out today. One way or another between me and you going to fix this. See what it done to him? What did he do? He went, bring it on. One man to another. So I got to confront him humbly. Now, I'm teaching you good this morning because this real life right here, this, this is where we really need to be living at. Hey, man, I got to go up to him and say, hey, look here, boy. I'm going to shake you with this other hand because this one. I'm, I'm one wing. Don't pull my wing out. I, I'm just playing with you too, so don't get mad at it. I got to confront him like this. Hey, boy, it's been a while. Man, look here. I want you to let you know something. Everything that went on, dude, I, I, my, my part of it, I'm sorry. I need your forgiveness. I need you to forgive me where I went wrong, where I hurt you, the pain I caused you. I want that to be gone because I want us back together. Now, see, the easy thing is to walk up and just say, yeah, man. I'd rather bust you than look at you and keep that spirit. The hard thing is because the devil gets on me and says, man, he ain't going to receive you. You are. He's mad at you just like you're mad at him. Y'all are going to bow up in the church and throw down a fight. Now, come on, guys. Come on, man. Huh? Ain't that what runs through our minds? But the Spirit of the Lord says that peace is worth fighting for. God wants me and Him reconciled. So in order for me to reconcile with Him, I've got to confront Him humbly. Say that with me. I've got to confront humbly. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. So in order for me to be on the right page with God, I've got to realize if me and that guy's got an art against one another and I really need a divine connection with God in my life right now, well, then God says, hey, I'm not interested in what you're asking for now because there's something blocking me from getting to you. And that something that's blocking me is that thing you got against your brother, the one that I died for. Woo, I'm preaching so good. You see, here's what we've got to understand right here. This is really the nuts and bolts of it right here. You see, if I've got ought against you, what are you? What are you in the spiritual realm? What are you? You're a child of what? Son of God. Son of God. With a little F. So if I have an ought against him, I have an ought against who? Huh. Huh. What a revelation. Well, I don't like to see it that way, preacher, because, you know, sometimes everybody says they're Christians just ain't really. You know. You're right. They're not. But you ain't the judge of that. You're not the judge of that. And God didn't ask me even to judge them out. He said, let the wheat and tares grow together, and when I come, I'll separate those. Don't you know what he was saying? He was saying, mind your own business. 
All you need to worry about is, if you got a broken relationship, do what I told you to do to fix it. If they don't receive you, then wipe off the dust of your feet and go about your business and my peace will return unto you. But if we don't do what God says, we walk around in turmoil. And every time I see in Walmarts, all them old feelings are going to come back again. I had some, I'm going to say this, and i got to move to the next point, but I, I'll say this to you real quick. Like, I remember one time I thought, you know, I left it there. And I was praying, and I was needing God to really do a miracle, and I left it there. I really, I thought I really got a breakthrough on it, sister. I really did. I prayed, and I asked God's forgiveness of it all, you know. Me and this person didn't see eye to eye, and we had a little blow up, you know, and we parted our ways, and we were brothers, and I said, you know what? You know, I, I didn't do nothing to that guy, you know. I mean, he just, you know, he didn't like what I wanted or like what I, I justified me. And I'd done it to God. And I thought I got a breakthrough. So about six months down the line, I'm laying on my face praying, asking God to give me that breakthrough. I'm wanting revival to come. And you know what I seen? I saw from a long way off, all I could see was a little tiny black dot. I mean, little bitty thing. Way off. And I was like, what in the world am I seeing? And as I began to lay there, that dot just slowly began to come closer to me. And as it got there, you know, I could see it more and more clearly. And I got to looking at it. I said, God, what am I seeing? He said, that's that spot in your heart. I said, but what is that? He said, that seed in your heart that's contaminating you from moving forward with me. I said, but God, what is it? He said, it's unforgiveness. Oh, my God. I broke. I went to squalling and crying. I said, well, God, I don't disknock anybody. I don't hate no one. And the Holy Ghost called me a liar. You a liar. You hate your brother because you have refused to make it right. I said, God, I begged for your forgiveness on this, God. He said, but you didn't leave it at the altar and go to him and make it right. And therefore, it's still there. I said, but God, I, I really, I thought I made it right. I thought everything was good. I thought it was this. He said, well, why did you feel that way last week when you saw him in Walmart? Why did you start shaking all over when you saw him, when you rounded around the aisle and you saw him face to face? Why did you start jerking all over like you wanted to jump on him? Ooh. You see, I know I ain't the only one like that. I'm just preaching real to you today. I'm just letting you have a little bit of who I am today and let you know this thing is for real. Life is real. And if we don't deal with it the way that God has commanded us to deal with it, we'll rehearse the same old garbage over and over and over and we won't ever get the peace that God wants us to have. You know what I did? I packed up right then. I took off over that dude's house. I got there, he didn't like me being there. Matter of fact, didn't receive me at all. And he asked me why I was there, and I told him. He said, Me and you don't have no words for one another. Get off my property. I said, But you got to know that I love you and that I'm sorry that we had an ought against each other. He said, You got the problem, man, not me. I said, So be it then. I'm just saying, I'm sorry. And I want you to know I love you. And this thing between me and you is over as far as I'm concerned. Peace to you, my brother. And I backed away and walked off. When I got in my car, it was like a tidal wave flowed into that car. I broke down. I began to weep and cry. I'm telling you, such a cleansing came upon me. You may tell you what was going on. I fought for peace. Amen. By going there, every devil in hell screamed at me and told me not to do it. You don't owe him nothing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just telling you how it is. I'm telling you, I fought it, Sister Ashley, with everything in me. Don't you go over there. You don't owe him nothing. You're going to look like a weak little punk. In my weakness, his strength was perfected. And I can promise you this. Amen. When I left there, I felt stronger than I've ever felt in my life. Why? Because I knew that I obeyed God. And I'm free today from that. I'm free today because of that. Now, my second point is to love deeply. To love deeply. Above all, 
love each other deeply in 1 Peter 4 and 8. Now, this word in the Greek, amen, deeply means, and it's pronounced sort of like this. I know I'm tearing it up, but it means, it's ektino, ektino. And that word means, amen, to stretch or to extend. Amen. Now, so when God is telling us, First Peter here is telling us, amen, to, 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 to love deeply, amen, he is telling us to ectino. He is telling us to stretch or to extend ourselves in love. In other words, it ain't always easy, friend, to love somebody. You know, understand? Hey, man, you, you ever watch them in the Olympics and when they're running? Hey, man, and they, they go in there. And when they get to the end of the line, that runner is running as fast and as hard as they can possibly run. And you're going, my God, man. And they're about this far back. And the other person's about that much farther out in front of them. And I've watched a guy one time. He ectono. Yeah, he was run and won the race because he was able to stretch himself or extend himself out far enough to go across the line first. You see, sometimes God is wanting you to ectono in your relationship. <laughs> Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost right here. He is wanting us to extend extend ourselves to stretch ourselves a little you see sometimes god lets us go through things amen even maybe even this little arm problem that i'm having that i can stretch myself to another level can i preach right here a minute amen you see sometimes god wants us to stretch out from the normal or from the comfort zone amen and to act to know out of our comfort into something unfamiliar Like preaching today, winged with an arm, man, is uncomfortable for me. I like to point with this hand. I feel so stupid right now because I can't really get it out there and do what I want to do with it. But I can tell you, it's not stopping what God is wanting me to do. You want me to tell you what it is? God had to wing me so I'd slow down and talk to you today. Because if I had this wing right here today, you know what I'd be doing? I'd be jumping and hooping and hollering and foaming at the mouth and shouting all over the place trying to preach this to you right now. And God wanted me to slow this thing down to let you know that sometimes you need to act to know. You need to stretch yourself. You see, a lot of times, you know, we don't do anything unless it's comfortable for us. <laughs> Ooh, we had somebody one time... You know, in praise and worship team, and you know, and, and every time we would get to a song, you know, and it was, I mean, boy, I mean, it'd be just like one of them songs, you know, you really got to act to know in that. You got to stretch out. You got to let it out. You got to push yourself sometimes, and you can't worry about what you're going to sound like. Hello. Let it fly. Hey, Amen. Sometimes you just got to stretch out and do something that's out of your comfort zone. Hey, Amen. I was talking to Ricky before the church service began, and Ricky hadn't been playing bass with us very long. And I told him, I said, man, you're really starting to settle down with us now, boy, and play that bass. And he just looked at me and smiled. I said, you're not quite as nervous as you was. And he's like, no. He said, man, I was nervous when we first started, though. I said, yeah, you feel like you're going to throw up and stuff, right? And, you know, and what do you mean by all that? I'm saying, you know, I told him, I said, well, I'm that way every time church starts. Right before church starts, man, I feel like I'm going to vomit every time. I'm up there like, oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. Let's get all this stuff started. And I had an old man tell me this one time. He said, if you ever lose that, quit. Because you have learned how, and you're not dependent on God no more. Right. Amen. I want to tell you right now, I, every time I get up on the platform, I've got to act a little bit. Right. I've got to stretch out a little bit because I, I know that if God don't give it to me, it's not going to be there. There just ain't going to be enough there because I am not smart enough. Hey Amen. Hey, I just don't have enough education. I don't have enough of this or that or the other. Hey Amen. To make this thing happen the way that God makes it happen. And I understand and know that. But I'm talking about relationships right now. This is the reason why a lot of times that our churches don't go to the place that God really wants it to go to. It's because we're not willing to act and know. Stretch. Do something uncomfortable. Get out of your little comfort box. Do something that's going to challenge you. Do something that you're going, to, you're going to either fall flat on your face or you're going to shine like a new diamond. You see, most of the time I've noticed this in my experience with the Lord that if I do anything for God, it's always out there, so far out there. You know, my wife says, I'm like this, go big or just go home. She said, you just got to go all out on everything. No, I said, yep, that's the only way I know. Every time God uses me, it's always in an ectono. Amen. It's always in something I've got to stretch out myself to see it take place. And if I don't stretch out, then I fall flat on my face. A lot of folks don't do something for God because of that. 
Look at that. Hallelujah. Y'all see that? My pointer's working. A lot of times God calls you into a ministry. He's calling you out to do something that's not going to be easy for you. It's going to be hard. It's going to be very challenging. Maybe be challenging to your education. Even. When God called me to preach, it challenged my education. First thing I said to myself was, is I can't preach. I can't even read. How am I going to preach something I can't read? So I had to learn how, brother, to... I had to learn how to stretch out, amen, into unfamiliar territory. You see, you know, you, sometimes you just got to wade out. In order to swim, you'll never learn how to do that in the kiddie pool. As long as your knees and feet touch the ground, you'll never learn how to swim. Amen, you're going to learn how to swim when you can't touch bottom. Amen, to where you either swim or take on water. Let me tell you how I learned how to swim. I learned how to swim just like this right here. Amen, we was in the river out here at Shingle Mill Landing, and y'all all around here know what I'm talking about, the river. That's the river right there, buddy. It's deep. It's about 45 foot deep right there in front of Shingle Mill out there, and there's always a current. We in the boat right there fishing along the bank, and I'm looking at my dad and say, I want to go over there so I can learn how to swim. He said, boy, you want to learn how to swim? I said, yeah, take me over here and let me learn how to swim. He said, boy, I'm tired of hearing you talk like that. We're fishing right now. I said, I just want to learn how to swim. Splash. <laughs> he said, swim. <laughs> help me, help me. He said, swim. You want to learn how to swim? Come on. He coached me right to the boat. Pull me in the boat. I'm crying. I'm mad. I can't believe he told me you like that. Oh, my God, I'm going to drown. He said, shut up, boy. You didn't drown. You swam back to the boat. I don't want to hear you say you can't swim no more. He said, I told you about six foot out there, and you swam all the way back to the boat in the current. You can swim. You want me to tell you how I did it? I had to know. I got close to that boat. I stretched out and took my daddy by the hand. Yes, sir. I got out of that uncom uncomfortable situation real quick like. Amen. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is this. Sometimes in your life, amen, God is going to put you in a situation in your love life, in your married life, in your home life, and in your church life, and in your community life to where you actually need to be the one stretching. I know we don't like to be the one stretching, but God really requires more of you and me than he does those in the world. Why is this? Because there's a lot. Of I had somebody tell me this one time. They said, Pastor Hart, I just don't understand. It seems like, you know, that you, I mean, he, and this guy was bragging on me, and I'm not bragging on me. Just telling you, I want to make an example. He said, Brother Hart, he said, you're a good guy. You're a good man. You're always fighting for good things. And he said, and it seems like every time you turn around that there's always something or somebody trying to destroy you. Why? He said, I just don't get that. You know, he said, you know what? He said, I let some people one time convince me that you were a bad person. I said, that's all right, buddy. He said, but you know what? He said, I remember what my mama told me. He said, and this is why I'm calling you. He said, mama told me, that the proof is always in the bottom of the bowl of the pudding. He said, here we are a few years down the line, and you're still the same preacher you was back then, still preaching the same way you were preaching back then, still doing the same things you were doing back then. He said, and guess what? He said, I've watched all them people that said those things about you. They have lied. They have lied. on, And they're lying on somebody else like they were lying on you back then, saying some of the same stuff that they said about you, they're saying about another preacher name. <laughs> Let me tell you what I learned is, when somebody starts talking about you, can I just share this with you real quick? Like, somebody starts trying to hurt your feelings and they start running you down and they're trying to destroy you, can I tell you what you have to do? You have to understand and know this right off the bat. Their opinion of me does not define me of who I am. What people say negative about you does not have a definition on really who you are. They don't know me. No. 
They didn't. Def- they don't. De- their their opinion of me or their their what their testimony of me is does not define me as who I really am. Only God can do that with me. Amen. And I want to tell you something. I understand and know something that with God I'm special because I am fearfully and wonderfully made with Him. Amen. And I want to tell you something. But even though I know this, it still has an effect on you. Can we be real? It still will have an effect on you. So what do you do, preacher? How do you get over that? How do you move forward? How do you not allow this to have an effect on you? I act to know. In the midst of all of this, somebody may be saying something bad about me or whatever the case may be or something bad about you. Hey, man, I have to act to know. I have to stretch out above it and not allow it to have an effect on me so I can keep on keeping on so when the enemy you know starts coming in like a flood what do we do we run to the lord which is our high tower amen we act to know we stretch out unto the lord and we allow him to lift us up above the floodways and in all of this god then begins to protect us and become our strength and our source of need everything we need then becomes comes from God because we have not stretched to the world and we haven't just sat there in it. We stretched out to Him. Let me tell you something. I don't know who you are this morning, but if your relationship is going through a struggle, I want you to realize that you may not have another opportunity to fix it besides today. You see, we, we look at our life as that we've got plenty of time to go. And we allow things to continue to go week after week after week after week, and we don't fix it. We don't ick to know. We don't stretch out into it and make it right. We let it continue to go forward and continue to go back. You know what it does? You ever had a sword that, or, a, or, or a hair? How many of you ever had an infected hair? Maybe on your arm or your leg or your eye or something on your eyelash or something. If you don't do something to it, If you don't work on that thing, if you don't work on it, it'll get worse and worse and worse, won't it? It festers up. Hey, man, let me tell you what happens. Hey, man, with with, with sin that gets in our life, if things that God is trying to touch in your marriage, in your home, in your family, in your church, in your community, if you don't do something about it, if you don't minister to it right away, you know what's going to happen? It's going to fester. You need to stretch out to it. You need to act to know. You need to stretch out into it and make it happen. When God is trying to do a work in your life, it's time then to make a move, not two weeks later. A lot of times we look at it and we say, you know what, you know, I think I'll just, I'll just let things go. I think I'll just pass it by. I don't think I'll mess with it today. Listen, you need to love deeply enough the things that you're involved in that you're willing to stretch yourself to the limit to make it happen. What are you saying, Pastor Hart? I'm saying that you've got to love your wife deeply enough that when she needs you to hear her that you hear her that you love your husband enough that when he has needs in his life that you need to be there to meet those needs that you love deeply enough that you echo to the place with your children that you get out of your comfort zone even see what's important in their life You see, I've learned as a, pa- as a pastor and also as a daddy. You know, I, I had to get that balance right. When I first started pastoring, I was uh, trying to be pastor all the time to Jonathan and not so much daddy to him. Can I tell you? Uh, I got to be the priest of the home. And when I'm the priest of the home and that balance is there right then, I, I'm daddy. And sometimes, you know, I I have to love that boy deeply enough and and that little girl deeply enough that when when I'm loving them that I have to sometimes put my stuff aside, my feelings, my opinions. Sometimes I got to put them aside and listen to this little growing mind and see where they're headed. And I can tell you right now, that's not always easy for me because if you don't believe me, just ask Jonathan. I'm very quick. 
very fast. You know, I, I respond real quick about stuff. Boom. When something happens I don't like, boom. I'm very fast on it. Hey, you better straighten that up right now. I don't like it. I don't like it. It ain't going to happen here, not my house. I'm the man here. Talk to him out of church. He'll tell you. But in order for me to get on a level playing field with him, to where me and him could come to an understanding to where we resolve things, not me dictate over it, which I'm good at, but that we resolve things. Guess what I have to do? I've got to love him enough. I've got to love him deeply enough that I'm willing to act enough. Stretch out of my comfort zone. My comfort zone is right now like a Barney Five. Let's nip this in the bud, man. Nip it, nip it, nip it. Sometimes I have to do that, you know, but then there's times I have to stop that. You know, see, because I can lose him if I'm not willing to love him out of my comfort. It's not always easy, but it is what God is asking us to do because, you see, God wants me and him to have peace. He wants me and her, my little girl, to have peace. How many of you have ever seen uh, uh, daddies and sons that hate each other? They can't get along. When the boy grows up, they just can't get along. They hate each other. See, mamas and daughters, they can't stand one another. Let me tell you something. That's not peace. You mean, what, you mean tell you what happens? Somewhere down the line, somebody quit fighting for peace. It's just easier to let them do whatever they want to do than deal with it. Know anybody like that? I do. Let me tell you something. It's worth fighting for. Your relationship with your family, with your friends, with your mama, with your daddy, with your wife, amen, with your children, with your church family, it's worth fighting for. What if you only had 30 more days to live? Would you love your church family good enough that no matter who you had trouble with, you'd make it right? If you only had 30 days left to live, what would come to your mind? I'll tell you what would come to your mind. Point number three. Forgive irrationally. Forgive irrationally. Colossians 3 and 13 says, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievousness you may have against one another. Bear with each other. Forgive as the Lord forgave you in Colossians 3 and 13. Forgive as God has forgave you. My God, He's forgiven you of everything. Have you forgotten today what God has forgave you of? You know, when I was preparing for this message, I sat down, sister, and I started just reminiscing and I said, what did God forgive me of? You know what he forgave me? Let me, just, let me just give you a few things. He forgave me of being a liar. He forgave me of being a thief. He forgave me of being vile, unaffectionate, murdering. He forgave me of lust, sins of perversions. He's forgiven me of pornography. He has forgiven me of coveting. He has forgiven me of gossiping, backbiting, cheating, murmuring, complaining. He has forgiven me of drugs, of alcohol. He has forgiven me of all kinds of sins. And when I begin to sit down and I begin to look at all these things that God has forgiven me of, and I said, you know what, God? You know, the problem that we have as, as Christians is, is that we lose sight of just how vile we was and just what God had to forgive us of. And I can tell you this on another level of how much He has to forgive you on a daily basis of. Ooh. That's staggering, ain't it? And then we look at others around us and we... Judge them 
by the things they've done to us. And God has said, forgive them as I've forgiven you. On the cross, Jesus stretched wide and hung high. Amen. They're looking at him and they walk by and they wag their head and they murmur at him and they say, oh, your God, come off that cross. Then I believe that you're him. Spit on him. They took, amen, a sword and they pierced his side. They put a crown of thorns upon his head and they beat him and they called him this and they called him that. They took his garments and gambled over him and mocked and made fun of him, stripped him naked for all the world to see. And there he hung high and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hallelujah. Christ is saying to you today, Forgive irrationally. You see, for Jesus to forgive you would be as completely irrational. The man that thrust the sword in his side, amen, fell at his feet when Jesus said, Forgive him, Father. He looked up and said, Surely he is the Son of God. Friend, I want to tell you right now, the forgiveness that Christ gave to you and to me and to all of them of that day, amen, was irrational. Amen. And God is saying to you and to me today, it's irrational sometimes for you to forgive those that has hurt you, those that has despised you, those that have rejected you, those that have criticized you. Forgive them irrationally. Forgive them anyway. And let the love of God fill your heart with peace. So when we're here today and we're examining our lives and we're saying, Father, what's the most important thing in our lives? What is the most valuable thing that I possess today? Would it be my possessions? Would it be my material gains? Would it be my money? Would it be my car? Would it be my job? Or would it be the relationships that God has placed in my life? I'd be willing to say this and then we're going to watch this video. that some of the most precious relationships you will ever have on this planet, the devil has destroyed with one little stupid thing. Because we didn't fight for the peace to heal it. It's gone. Now I'm going to say this, you, some relationships are gone, you'll never get it back. But you can make a difference today and determine today that I'm not going to lose one more Relationship. I'm determined from this day forward to fight for the peace. I'm going to fight for that peace, that I'm going to maintain it, that I'm going to let God fix it in our lives. I'm not just going to put it off on God, but I'm going to be what God has called me to be, a peacemaker. I'm going to seek and search and fight for the peace of God. Play that video for me, Johnny. Hallelujah. You know, just the value of everything else is just gone. It's all for nothing. And you, you read the Bible and you go to church and you listen to the Word, you know, and you talk about that. You can't take it with you. And, and how you're not supposed to live, you know, for those treasures. Those are the wrong kinds of treasures. Jesus. You know, I think those things that I thought were urgent aren't all that urgent. You know, they're not, um, I don't know. I, I wanted to go to this place. I wanted to go here and travel there, and I wanted to do this and do that. And while those things are important, um, I find that they're not what I'm missing. And, and I have clothes in there that still have the price tags on them that at some point really meant a lot to me. And I just patted them all and just touched them, and I was like, this is all for nothing. It's all for nothing. This means nothing. These clothes are for nothing. The shoes are for nothing. All your shoes, you shoes, shoes, shoes for nothing. You know, I just, just keep going around looking at it going, it's just all for nothing. The only, the only thing that means anything are the people. Well, what's important is, you know, and um, the rest is not all that big of a deal. 
You know, the people who have come forward, the people who've reached out to us, who've come over, who've helped us. <sighs> you know, it's drawn my husband and I, I think, a lot closer. I mean, I, I know that man loves me. There is no doubt in my mind that that man loves me. I mean, he, he just puts up with so much. <laughs> and he's there. And um, he thinks I'm beautiful, even when I'm bald, <laughs> you know? And um, he's a good man. And I feel like I can talk to him about anything. I mean, we can, we've had some really deep conversations, um, things that we probably wouldn't have had had I not been sick. And with my girls, I think I'm just more in tune with them, you know? I'm not as likely to shove them off, you know? <laughs> Sometimes kids can be kind of annoying, you know? And, uh, but I'm more likely to just take that in, drink them in, you know? To all my friends and my wife, there's only three words that I could say. I love you. We'll make that five words. I love you very much. Remind me, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, that my life is fleeing away. My life is no longer than the width of my hand. An entire lifetime is just a moment. It's just a moment. Human existence is but Our time here is just here one minute, it's gone the next. You know, the thing that really mattered, all these people now have gone on to be with the Lord. They have all died of terminal illness. First lady, she died with, I think it was liver cancer. Second lady there, she died with breast cancer. And there the guy, Larry, he died with Lou Gehrig's disease. And all of them, before they got sick, all their testimonies you've seen, each one of them, through this series, each one of them had successful careers and successful things going on. But when it came down to reality that their life was fading away fast, they said none of those things mattered anymore. I liked what Larry had to say when he said, I wouldn't let a ball game, a sporting event, or anything else keep me away from my family and the ones that I love. He said, before I got sick, I was very selfish. And all I thought about was myself and what I wanted for the moment. He said, but now I wake up every day looking for another minute to spend with the ones I love. What's keeping you? What's keeping you, amen, from being what God wants you to be? Who do you need to ask forgiveness of? Who do you need to confront? Who do you need to work things out with? Maybe it's your children. I don't know. Maybe it's your family, your wife, your kids, your mom, your dad. I, I don't know. Maybe it's your next door neighbor or the guy on the job. But what's holding you back from being all that God wants you to be? I can tell you, for the most part, I believe the thing that holds us back the most is unforgiveness. Not willing to fight for peace. Not willing to let go of past hurts and experiences and allow the peace of God to rest in our hearts and in our lives to the way that God really wants to be in our hearts and lives. You're saying, well, pastor, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't believe it that way. I don't believe that I'm not a Christian. I'm not saying you're not. I'm saying I'm telling you that you can allow unforgiveness in your life 
to keep you from reaching goals that God wants you to have. Being where God wants you to be. Having what God wants you to have. Unforgiveness. It's a mean, one-eyed monster that wants to take every one of us in this room down and keep us from experiencing the blessings that God has for our lives. Who is it that's holding you back? Who is it that's keeping you from getting where you need to be? Can I, can I just beg you this morning? Make it right. Don't let another day go by. Don't let the sun go down today. As the Bible says, don't let it go down on your wrath. That means don't let it go down on your unforgiveness. Don't let one more day go by. You may not have tomorrow. It may come just like that. And these people, they got their sentence and they served it out sick. But you may not have that. You may not have that opportunity to make it all right before you pass away. So make it right now. Live in the moment. Live while you have time to live. And I promise you right now, you'll never be so grateful and thankful until the day you come to realize that you need to make each moment count. I just want to do what God wants me to do. I just want to be what God wants me to be. And I want to give everything that I can to God. So if there's someone that, that has hurt you, that someone that, it, that you hold an ought against, can I command it to you today? Amen. Go to them and make it right. Don't let the day go. Let them know you love them. Let them know you're praying for them. Let them know that you've forgiven them and you want their forgiveness back. Hey, man, if they don't love you back, if they don't receive you back, it's okay. Just go in the peace of God know that you did all you could do so now just stand would you stand with me all over the building we want to sing a song to you this morning sing this song this morning I want you to just lift up your heart and worship him we're going to give God his time to work in our hearts this morning hallelujah Jesus I need you more, more than yesterday, I need you, Lord, more than words can say, I need you more, and then I need you more, more than yesterday, I need you more, more than words can say, I need you more, than ever before, I need you more, I need you building this morning you say brother Hart I know I need God in my life I need his Holy Spirit to lead me and guide me and direct me in every course of life that I make and I'm asking you this morning that you just be obedient to God 
and that you would allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in you today. You would live like you don't have tomorrow. You say, you know what, God? Most important thing is making some things right. It's making some things right. And I don't, I don't know who it is, but I could, be, I could just be willing to bet this morning that there'd be everybody in this room here this morning that there's someone that you've got a problem with. Either they're talking bad about you or you're talking bad about them. They've done something to you or you've done something to them. There's some type of discord, whether it be your family, your wife, your husband, your kids, your mama, your daddy. There's some kind of discord that's going on there that's breaking up the peace that God wants you to have. I'm going to say this morning that every one of us in this room here this morning has got something or someone we need to make some things right with. So I want to open this altar up to you this morning. And I want you to just come. I don't want to try to dissect it all out this morning out of your life and get you to raise your hand and admit to the thing that you need God to do in your life. You know what it is, you and God. You know right now this morning, you know your heart is beating right now. You know exactly what God has put His finger on. So without anything further to say, we're going to sing this song again. When we start singing, I want you to just get out from where you're at and I want you to find you somewhere in this altar. And I want you to begin to call on God and say, God, I'm going to, I'm going to reconcile. I'm going to fix some things. I'm going to put some missing pieces back together again. I'm going to see you work in my life because I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. Would you come? I need you, Lord, more than yesterday.